It's great to be here this morning. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm out, like a little bit out of sorts, but um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here, excited for what the Lord wants to do this morning. Cody is on a little vacation, which we're, we're happy for because um, I don't know if you guys know, but his wife, Laura, is pregnant and she's due next month, which is really exciting. And so they're, they're getting away for about, I think, nine or 10 days and they should be back this week. But um, he asked me to teach today and I was like, absolutely, I would love to. It's been a little bit since I've been able to teach um, for Sunday morning and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity we are going to take a little bit of a detour and be in Colossians. So if you do have your Bible or your phone app or something like that, you can turn to Colossians chapter 3. Um, I uh, am the pastor of the college ministry, and we've been going through the book of Colossians together. And it's been really good, at least for me, hopefully for them too. And, um, and so I was like, man, I, I really want to teach Colossians. And I think it's kind of cool because... Cody taught a couple, maybe about a month ago, maybe a little bit more, in Colossians chapter 2. And he was talking about the sanctification and the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. If you guys remember, it's, he was talking about how, you know, our sins were nailed there on the cross. You imagine all the sins, you know, flowing from the cross. And, uh, and Jesus is there and he's thinking of you and he's thinking of me. And, uh, and so it's such a powerful message. If you guys want to go back and, and listen to that, you can on our website. Um, I do want to give you just a little bit of backstory before we jump in. So Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, but he did not plant the church. A guy named Epaphras is probably the one that actually planted the church there in Colossae. And uh, most likely Epaphras uh, visited with Paul at some time and said, hey, these are all the things going on in the church. You know, I kind of imagine like Pastor Cody uh, meeting with another pastor and saying, hey, these are all the things happening at ACF. You know, all the good things and then the bad things like Ron Gassman, you know, like he, he's, exp no, I'm just kidding. Um, but he's explaining all the good and, and things that maybe he's concerned with. And so in chapter one, uh, verses three through four, Paul writes to them and he says, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And check this out. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid. So what Paul has known about this church there in Colossae is that they um, have faith, and they're faithful to the Lord, and they also love the saints. Man, I hope that's said about our church. I'm sure it is, but that we're faithful church that love to serve others. That's why we get excited about things like this Saturday for going to access or the work days that we have, because we want to serve Jesus as a church, and we want to love the saints. We want to love one another, but... Um, Paul did have some warnings. Again, Epaphras may have, may have told Paul that, hey, he, I have some concerns. There's some things going on in the city that I'm concerned for our church and concerned for the furtherance of the gospel. And, uh, and that's false teaching, false doctrine. And so there are two forms of it that we saw in, uh, in the city and in the church and that was philosophy. If you're taking notes, there was philosophy going around where a lot of these Greeks or Gentiles who have been saved, they believe in Jesus. They're saying, okay, Jesus was a good man. He did some powerful things. So yes, we're going to worship Jesus, but we're also going to worship our Greek gods or goddesses. And so they were kind of putting Jesus with these other gods and it was false teaching and they were coming in maybe to the church and saying, hey, you can, you can worship Jesus, but you can also worship these other things. And then um, the other one that we see is a legalism was starting to spread into the church as well. You know, tempting other people to live according to legalism. It's the same exact thing where you probably had Jews who were living according to the old law, the Old Testament of keeping all of tr the traditions and kind of some crazy traditions that they sort of in some ways like made up. And, uh, 
And they're trying to show the church that, hey, yes, Jesus is great. Jesus is good. We should live for Jesus. But you also need to do good things and do good works in order to be loved by him. But that's not how we live. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus has given us grace. And he's given us mercy. And it's received by us. So there was two things. And I just want to uh, just read this verse two. He, he says to beware of this in verse eight. Beware lest anyone cheat you. Sorry, this is chapter two, verse eight. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and em- empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So Jesus, or sorry, Paul is saying, do not get you know, sucked into the basic things of the world, philosophies and legalism and all these other things. It should be all about Christ. Christ needs to be center in your life. And I can't help but think that maybe Paul is writing to us here at ACF today. You know, we live in a city where you go out into Ashland and it's full of philosophies and spiritualism and religions and in anti-God, you know, and all kinds of different things. And maybe even some legalism of, oh, I have to do good works to get to heaven. And, uh, and I can't help but think that Jesus today wants to teach us, hey, keep me centered. Be grounded in me. And that's what we want at our church. In fact, when you come to the foyer, you see Jesus on the wall. And and up here on this cool stand thing, it says Jesus on top of it. Maybe you didn't know that, but it says Jesus. We want Jesus to be centered. It's not about Brad. It's not about Cody. It's not about the other leaders of our church or whoever. It's about Jesus. Jesus only. And, uh, And so that could be the central part of our message today is all about the Lord. So let's pray. And then we'll dive in. Lord, we we do want to keep you first, Lord. Out of all of our priorities, Lord, every single one of us have our own routines and agendas and things that are going on in our life, Lord. But we, we need to put you first, Lord, and keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. So would you speak to us in that way? Father, would there be um, encouragement this morning, Lord, and and also challenges, Lord, in ways that we can go forth from here and, and be a light for you, God, to, to proclaim your gospel um, to maybe a dark community, Lord. And, and so we just ask for your, uh, your grace this morning, for your mercy, Lord, that you um, would just teach us exactly what we need to hear in your name. Amen. So this morning... I'm going to give you three different truths or three different encouragements. So if you are taking notes, you can write these things down. Um, And then I'm also going to give you three different ways to walk those out or to be doers of those encouragements. Because I believe that if we're encouraged by something, it should show outwardly in our actions. And, uh, And so that's how we're going to kind of tackle this morning Let's go ahead and and read. We're in Colossians 3, and we're just going to read the first four verses, and then we'll jump in. So it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. For you died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I read a story of a, um, a teacher, ch- kids ministry teacher, children's ministry. And, uh, and he was talking to a bunch of the kids, some kindergartens, first grade, about heaven and how to get to heaven. And so he asked them three questions on how to get to heaven. He asked, he said, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and I gave all the money to the church, would that get me to heaven? No, all the kids, you know, erupted. No, that doesn't get you to heaven. And so he asked another question. He says, okay, if I cleaned uh, the church every day, if I mowed the yard and I kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? 
And again, all of them agreed together, and they're like, no, that doesn't get you to heaven. So he asks one last question. He says, okay, then, uh, if I was kind to all the animals, and I gave candy to all the children, you know, of the world or whatever, and I loved my wife, would that get me into heaven? And they all said, no. I don't know who said yes. No, it doesn't get you into heaven. Uh, And so he says, okay, then, well, how do I get to heaven? And then one of the five-year-old interrupts everyone else and says, you got to be dead. (laughs) So true. You do. You got to be dead, right? And although he was probably talking physically, like you have to die to go to heaven, but here we're going to see that Paul is talking that we have to be dead to the flesh, We have to be dead to the old man. We have to be dead to the basic principles of the world. We have to be changed. That's what that means, to be changed. So if you look again, the first encouragement we'll see is that although we have to be dead to sin, it says in verse 1 that you will be raised with Christ. That's your first encouragement. You will be raised. And uh, over and over, we're going to see that he talks about death in some of these passages I have. In fact, Romans chapter six, verse four, it says, therefore we were buried, again, buried um, is death, with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we were dead, resurrected, boom, newness of life. We're, fr- we're fresh, we're free in him. And then a very popular verse, I'm sure you know, Galatians chapter two, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What an encouragement it is to know That when we get saved, when we say yes to Jesus, Lord, I want to pursue you, I want to go all after you, then we're we're dead to our flesh. In fact, that's what baptism represents, that when we go underneath the water, we're actually saying no to the flesh, no to our old self, how we used to live, and we come up and we're a new creation, a new man, a new woman in Christ. And it's a beautiful picture of what God has done for us. Even Paul said that in verse three, he says, you, you died. You died. He's talking to believers and he's saying, you died. You died to the things of the world. So that's the first encouragement that we were raised up. The second one is uh, that you have been hidden. Go ahead and check out the last part of verse three. So he says, you died, but your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, hidden could really mean a couple different things. One of them is that hidden, this life, if you imagine a life, is hidden from unbelievers or from us when we, before we knew the Lord. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we, I'll actually just read it. It's some of my favorite verses of all time. I probably use it like every other week when I teach. Uh, But Ephesians chapter two, we once walked according to the prince of the power of the air, aka Satan. Satan was ruling, but verse four, I love verse four. It's like my life verse. It says, but God. You once were dead, you know, but God who is rich in mercy and has loved us with a great love Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And then he puts in parentheses, I love this, it's by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, everything was hidden from reality. You know, just like the old hymn says, uh, I once was lost but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. 
right? And so as an unbeliever, you, you can't fully see what God has for us, his free gift. And I, I like to imagine grace as a gift, like an actual package where the Lord is saying, hey, I just want to give this to you. Like, this is from me to you. I just want to give you this gift. But for us, it's to open that gift and to really realize that there's life in that grace. In fact, it reminds me of Castaway. Has anyone ever seen Castaway before? Starring Tom Hanks. If you don't know what Castaway is, Tom Hanks is uh, basically the head honcho of, of FedEx. And he's uh, shipping all these packages, trying to get as fast as he could so that FedEx, like, rises to the top. But anyway... They're on a plane, the plane malfunctions, and he drives in, flies into the ocean. And uh, he's the only one to survive. And he washes up on a shore, and he's there on an island uh, for five years. Can you imagine that? It just makes me sick thinking about it. But five years on this island. And the first, I don't know, a few weeks, months, I don't know how long the timeline is, but he starts seeing all these FedEx packages uh, arriving on shore. And so just as any of us would do, you would go over there and it's like Christmas, you know, you're just like ripping open all of these FedEx packages to see what you can use, see what's out there for you. And so he's finding like, I don't know, ice skates and some other things that he can use, you know, the sharp ice skates and the, the shoelaces and stuff. Um, but he, it, the uh, film shows him picking up a package and looking at it and deciding not to open it. So he puts it away. And at the end of the movie, sorry to spoil it for you, but he gets off the island and, um, and he has that package still in his hand and he takes it to the owner, to the address that's on the package. No one was home, so he leaves a note saying, hey, this package like saved my life. And I don't know why, because he didn't open it, but maybe just motivation, like I gotta, you know, give this package to its owner, you know, kind of a thing. And uh, well, anyway, long story short, uh, FedEx did like a spoof of it. Uh, a few years back for the Super Bowl commercials. Anyone see that one? If you haven't seen it, you should go watch it. It's pretty funny. But it's, it's not Tom Hanks. It's another actor, but he's basically, it looks like Tom Hanks. He has a huge beard. He just got off the island and he has the package and he walks up, knocks on the door and a lady opens it and he says, hey, I've been uh, marooned on this island for five years with nothing, but this package got me through because I just wanted to deliver it to you or something. And, and she goes, oh, thank you so much. She's so blessed by it, you know? And she turns to walk away and he's like, hey, uh, what's actually in that package? And she's like, oh, it's really nothing special. And she starts opening it. She's like, it's just, uh, you know, a satellite radio and a GPS tracker. And there's some water purifiers, you know, and, and some seeds, like some, for some veggies and stuff. It's really nothing special. And you see his face. He's just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I could have been off the island in just a week. And I know it's a funny analogy, but it reminds me of God's grace. Like it's given, but so many don't actually open it and receive it. It, it gives life. It gives eternity. It's, it's everything we need, but we don't always uh, open it to see what God has for us. And those are the hidden things. Those are the hidden things that maybe the world can't see, but God wants to give to us. And he wants to intervene in our life. The other thing that hidden can mean is that there is safety and security in the Lord. You know, there's a lot of Psalms that talk about that. You know, you'll set me high upon a rock. You know, you'll keep me and put me in your pavilion. Or in Revelation, when he talks to the churches and he says, if you overcome, uh, you will I will never blot your name out of the book of life. I love that verse. I think it's chapter three, verse five. If you overcome, if you conquer, you will never be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life because he is our protector and our guide, right? He's, he's our shepherd of the sheep. Once we become sheep, he watches over us. And then number three, the last encouragement I wanna to give to you this morning is that we will appear with him in glory. Go ahead and look down at verse four. It says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. And I love this passage because um, it could 
I, I wonder if Paul was thinking about the second coming of Jesus. And he was like, man, one day Jesus is going to come and he's going to appear before his church and we're going to be caught up into the clouds and we're going to see him in all of his glory. But whether he was talking about that or whether he was talking about passing from this uh, life into eternity, we will see Jesus' face. It's going to be glorious to behold. Just like when Peter, James, and John, they're up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and he's glowing, and he's shining, and radiant. And you remember what Peter says? He says, this is a good thing. You know? This is good, man. This is awesome. Your face is like glowing and stuff. Like, it's crazy, you know? And, uh, and that's how we're going to be. Like, what are we actually going to look like? Are we going to fall on our knees before him? Are we going to be at a loss for words? Probably. You know, what's going to be going through our mind and our heart during the time when we actually see Jesus face to face? So these are three encouragements that I'm hoping will propel us into wanting to um, challenge ourselves, challenge ourselves to grow more in in knowing Jesus, to grow more in putting away the things that are evil and clinging to the things that are good. Because again, I think that the encouragements should propel us into action. It's kind of like if your boss says, hey, I love your work ethic. I love everything that you're doing. In a few months time, I would like to consider you for a promotion. Now, it would be not wise it would be foolish of you to say, sweet, I'm being considered for a promotion. Now I can just kick back and relax, you know? And you stop working hard. And you sh stop showing up for work and all that kind of stuff. There's no action that would be unwise because then he'd be like, wait, I told you that you're up for a promotion. Now nothing's going on, you know what I mean? And, and so it, we would do the opposite. We would actually work harder and we would, you know, maybe be even earlier. We would just want to do everything in our power to get that promotion. Well, the same thing should be for our encouragements being translated into action. And it's not about works. It's not about, I got to do these works to get to heaven. It's about, wow, God has been so good to me. I can't help but just be totally open about it. You know, I can't help but just let it be on my lips and let it be, you know, it, the very outward of uh, -ness of who I am. So three things, and I'm actually gonna couple them all together because I noticed first service that I sort of run everything kind of together. Um, so three things, three things that we need to do uh, in action steps. Number one is we need to always be looking up. As you walk this world, as we live here, as long as that takes, we need to be looking up, looking above. Number two, we need to put off. And that means take off the things of the world. Take off the things that are not godly. That's number two of action. And then number three, you probably guessed it, but we need to put on we need to actually put on the things of Christ. Put on the things of Jesus. So go ahead and look down in your Bibles and you'll see the first four verses that, I, um, that we already read. It says, so you're raised with Christ because of that encouragement that we've been raised with Christ. It says, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. So when you know that you have been changed, when that makes sense, not only in your heart, but also in your mind, then all of a sudden you need to make this shift where you're like, okay, I'm gonna stop focusing so much on the things around me, and I need, I'm gonna focus more on what Jesus has for me because I'll tell you this, G what Jesus has for you, his will for your life is so much better than anything you can create. If he created you from birth, if he formed you in your mother's womb, he's given you breath all the way until now, like I think he knows what's best for us in our lives. And, and I, find my, I, I find myself kicking I kick myself sometimes because 
I'm like, man, I, I just always tried to do things on my own. I'm always trying, you know, it must be a man thing. I don't know, but I'm always trying to have control and just, I just want to do things on my own. And I forget that, man, when I look to the Lord, it always is so much better. It's always, always so much better. And so Paul, I think, was really clear about this. A couple times he mentions the word above. And we know that it doesn't mean a physical thing. It doesn't mean walking around just with our heads up because we would look weird and no one would want to come to church if you looked up, you know, just walking around. No, but spiritually looking up, looking unto God. And here's where Jesus says, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. This is a picture of authority. This is a picture of Jesus being our all in all, everything that we need seated at the right hand of God. It also is a picture of him being our mediator. If you know the Old Testament, you know that the high priest would once a year go into the Holy of Holies, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place, the rest of the temple. And he would go in to make intercessory prayer and, and sac, you know, have given up everything, um, all the sins and everything of the nation to the Lord. And he would, you know, be a mediator. Um, but when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn. And Jesus says that I became the mediator. And that's what he is. He's seated at the right hand of God and we can come to him with whatever we have and say, Lord, it's yours. You're the mediator. Isn't that encouraging? I love that. So I guess there's four encouragements this morning. You guys can have that one for free. Jesus will tell us, we know in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, he tells us, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. And he's talking about when things are really, really rough, when things are hardship, when you're worried about tomorrow, you're worried about what's going to come, how you're going to put food on the table, all that kind of stuff. He says, if you just seek first the kingdom of God, if you set your eyes on the things above, all these things will be added to you. God will take care of you. And that's so true. I've seen it over and over in my life, how the Lord just is sufficient and the Lord is uh, the provider and, and the Lord is always so faithful to me. And I know that he will be faithful to you as well, as long as your eyes are fixed on him. Seek first the kingdom of God. And I, and I didn't even say this, I don't know why, but it's and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, his characteristics of who he is. And that's what part of putting on this new man, taking off the old man, putting on this new man, this new characteristic of looking more and more like Jesus. That's what that means. Um, you know, I was thinking that if we are so, if our eyes are so fixed on heaven, then our passions and desires for the earth will greatly fade, right? It, it kind of reminded me like years and years and years and years ago when I graduated high school. Um, I'm super, I'm pretty old. So I, I'm just a little bit younger than some of you. And uh, it was just so long ago. I, can't, I barely can remember it. But what I do remember is that uh, I was excited to graduate. Man, I could not wait. Like nothing was gonna ruin my mood. In the beginning, like maybe of the year, I had senioritis, I was ready to graduate. But two weeks before graduation, I was just like, man, I don't care. Like, give me a test. I don't care. I'll take a test. I'm, I'm going to graduate in two weeks. You know, I just had that kind of feeling. And that's kind of the heart that we should have towards heaven. Just like, man, whatever this world throws at me, it doesn't matter. I'm going to heaven. I don't care. You know, whatever hardship happens, like, it's cool. I, I'm going to heaven. It's fine. And I think that's why we should be so thankful for trials. Even, even Paul, when he said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because trials cause us to yearn for heaven. Trials cause us to yearn to be with Jesus. You know, I can't imagine going through trials without the Lord. I just can't. I can't imagine going through this life without the hope of heaven. 
I just can't, I can't imagine that. And so it's kind of this yearning that we have where the Lord says, hey, not only are these trials good for you because they produce patience and endurance in your life and they build a character in you, but also it causes you to yearn for heaven. And so then he says, verses five um, through 17, He's going to get into putting off and putting on this analogy of taking off the old clothes, the old man, and putting on the new, putting on the the right attire that you need. It's kind of like a football player. You know, if a football player goes out and he's going to take off his, you know, normal attire, you know, the really skinny jeans and stuff, and he's going to put on the pads and get ready to play ball. Or the swimmer who's going to wear the swim camp cap and the spandex and stuff so that they can swim as fast as they can. They're not going to swim in jeans and a sweatshirt. you got to put off the old and put on the new. And when we talk about putting on Christ, it's not about that we're putting on a show. It's not about, hey, I'm going to put on Christ today and, uh, and I'm just going to like go through the motions and stuff. But when I get home, I'm going to put off Christ and put on my old clothes again and I'm just going to lounge around the house. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you're putting on this new clothes to be more like Christ because as Christians, they were called little Christ, weren't they? That's what they were called. They were, they were like Christ. And so that's where we got the word Christian. And so we should want to be called that everywhere that we go. So Paul tells them, put off the old, put on the new. Look at verse five. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked, just like Ephesians chapter two, that used to be who you were when you lived in them. But then verse eight, but now you yourselves put, uh, are, are to put off, take these off of you, which is anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. It says, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with its deed. So Paul is saying that these things should not be named among you as a Christian. Now, Paul knows that we're not going to be perfect. Paul knows that we are not going to arrive until we appear with the Lord in glory. It's a continued thing that we put off and we put on. In fact, go ahead and keep reading. It says, you put off the old man with his deeds, verse 10, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That word renewed means that it's a continual renewal. You are being renewed day by day. The 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 you know, the more that you're in the word, the more you're spending time with Jesus and he's teaching you and sharing with you, your mind is being renewed. The more you yearn for heaven, it's like, you know, you're falling in love with Jesus and the more you love him, the more you want of him and not of the things of the world. That's what that talks about. And it reminded me when I was um, 18, I've, I walked away from Jesus and uh, you know, just kind of got burnt out from, from church and just started doing my own thing. And uh, one of the things that I really struggled with during that time was my language, my filthy language. And, um, <laughs> and so I, uh, I, when I came back to the Lord, Lord just radically like changed my heart and, and I started walking with him again about a year later after that. But I still had some, you know, bad language that I was like trying to get out of my mouth. And the Lord was helping with that. He was renewing me. And I remember I was helping with, um, with a youth group. And, um, and it was this, it makes the story so much better because it was Cody's younger brother. Um, but we were playing volleyball together. And I remember I was across the net from the, the Cody's younger brother. I'm not going to say who it was, but he knows. And, um, and I, I go to hit the ball and I totally miss it or something like I always do. I'm not very good at volleyball. And, and I say a bad word. And I like, I know what I did. You know, I said it and I was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And I look across the net and his eyes are just like, you know, he's like, 
he's only like 12, 12 years old. He probably has never heard a bad word in his life, you know, and his, his eyes are just huge. Like, how could you do this? And so I went up to him. I'm like, bro, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm still working on it, you know, kind of a thing. And so I think he understood maybe. Um, now he, yeah, he, he, I think he understood. But the point is, is that we're still, God is still working on our hearts, God is still working on that renewal that's happening within our lives. And uh, and Paul understood that, but he says, guys, you need to work hard at putting it to death, getting rid of sin. You know, sin can be so irresistible until it takes over you. You ever think about that? It's so easy to sin until you're just overwhelmed by it. It's kind of like when you put too much shampoo in your hair and it gets in your eyes, you know, it blinds you. It's like too much. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I, I, in fact, I, I, watched a, I watched a prank video. It's really messed up actually, and I don't condone it at all. But uh, these guys on Muscle Beach in, in California, there's like these stairs that come up and uh, underneath it is a shower. And so these like huge dudes, um, we're there like shampooing their hair and stuff and washing up. And uh, this prankster like gets up the stairs and um, keeps pouring shampoo on his head. Just keeps pouring it. And so every time he like gets it out, you know, and then, uh, and he goes to wash it out and he's like washing it out and it just keeps flowing because he can't feel the shampoo because all he feels is the water. You know what I mean? And so he's just getting frustrated and he can't see and it's pretty funny, but I don't condone it. It's not, it's not a good thing. Um, but that's how sin is. You know, sin just like overwhelms us. When you, I, I have always heard this quote growing up that sin will take you further than you ever thought you would go. It'll keep you there longer than you ever thought you would stay and it will cost you more than you ever thought you would pay. Sin is devastating, Sin is devastating. It's devastating to those you love. It's devastating towards you. Even when we read this list and we see that that Paul, really, he he was talking about a few things that could be secret sins. Fornication, uncleanness. You know, we even see that Greek word really is pornography. And a lot of things are, are secret. You know, other people don't know about it, but we don't realize the effect of it in our lives. We don't realize how sin devastates us if, we're, if we don't put it off, if we don't get rid of it, if we don't cut it off. That's why Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Your eye, pluck it out because you need to drastically deal with sin. In fact, that's what Paul said here. Uh, the, this Greek word is mortify, to put to death, to mortify it, to kill it. Do it right now, instantly. Get right with the Lord right now. If you have anything in your life where you know this is not good, this is not glorifying to God, this is not being an example of Jesus, then you need to kill it. You need to get rid of it. You need to take it off of yourself. You need to take action this morning. You need to confess it to someone. And then you're opening up up that FedEx package, right? And you're finding life. You're finding life. And this is what the new man looks like. This is why we are to get rid of those things. Verse 10, you've put on this new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who was created by him. Who created him, sorry. Sorry. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, again, he's bringing up the old, you know, chapters one and two, there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is your all in all. Christ should be your all in all. And then he carries on to verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. So instead of being someone that is angry, instead of using filthy language or dirty language or whatever that are putting people down, instead you're growing in humility, you're growing in kindness, you're growing in meekness, 
your, your long suffering towards people. And I've, I, you know, you see that change in your life. You totally see it. As you pursue the Lord, you're like, wow, he's doing a work in my life. Because I used to be so mad all the time. And now, God's just given me the ability to be patient with people. Or maybe you're someone that, man, I just couldn't help but lie all the time. And now I just can't help but just speak truth. You see that change happen from the old man to the new man. It's so powerful. And then check this out. I got to start wrapping up. Verse 14. Oh, I skipped a little bit, actually. So bearing with one another, verse 13, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. And then verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We know that. We saw it a couple weeks ago where Cody taught us the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. We are called to love each other. We are called to practice loving each other. And I loved Cody's sermon last week of serving one another. Love translate into doing things for each other and serving each other. It's the action that we see. And this is the bond of perfection. And the college students are going to laugh at me. They're sitting right here. But I have this um, flannel that I wear a couple, sometimes. And uh, no, I wear it a lot. And it's, it's just like, it just feels like a hug. Like I, I can't explain it other than that. It just, I put it on and I just feel loved, you know. And it's so warm. It has fleece inside. I got it from Costco. Costco just knocks it out of the park when it comes to clothing. And uh, they don't have any more. Don't go look. <laughs> they, I, they got rid of it. it. I bought the last one. I bought the only one. But anyway, uh, but I'll, I'll put on what other clothing I have. And then I'll put on that flannel. And that's all I need. Like, I don't need anything else. And, uh, and, and I have this picture that that's what love is. Love is that flannel. Put on your flannel of love. I got a couple laughs. That was good. But you should. That's what, that's what Paul is saying, that out of love, all these other things will come. If you are working on loving, loving the Lord and loving others, then you will find yourself being more meek and humble and long-suffering and merciful slow to anger, you know, all these things that come out of it, the fruit of the Spirit. When you read the fruit of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit is love. I, I think it's like the ringleader of all the other things, you know, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, self-control, you know, all those things come out of love. Just like the opposite, everything I think comes out of pride or selfishness. All sin that we see a lot of times comes out of because I want, because I have needs, because I want to be satisfied. But when we turn that to, no, I want to love and I want to give, then we start seeing Christ change us. So our, um, to be doers of this today is to say, okay, Lord, I want to look like you. I want to look like Christ because these are the characteristics of Christ. This is who he is. He's the humble one. He's long suffering towards you. Not only does he have to see everything you do outwardly, but he knows your mind. And yet he's long suffering and he's patient. And every time we come to him, he says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And I forget. Keep walking. You know, he says, keep Keep walking, my servant, my bond servant. Keep going. Keep looking up. Keep looking towards me. I know what's right for you. I know I, I have such a good plan for your life. And all you have to do is just trust me. But you have to get rid of your old self. You have to get rid of your old man. You have to wake up every morning and say, Lord, I want to put on the armor of Christ I want to put on love this morning. I want to put on tender mercies this morning. 
Isn't it so true that sometimes you wake up and you stub your toe or something and you already put in your mind that you're going to have a bad day? And so then everything else that happens, you're like, I knew I was going to have a bad day. I just knew it. It's because we already put that into our mind and our hearts. But if you wake up in the morning and you say, no, I'm going to have a good day with the Lord. I'm going, to, I'm going to put on tender mercies and put on long suffering. I'm going to put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Then you see the powerful work that God wants to do. You, you have life. You see the life that you have, the joy that you have. In fact, look at the next verse. In worship team, you can come up. Verse 15, it says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. So he says, once this begins to happen, once there is this, um, this love, this outer garment of love, the bond of perfection, you will see peace in your life. No longer do you have to like be concerned with the world and be worried about the world and you know, you're just going to be looking up and saying, Lord, oh, man, I just have peace. I just have peace in the Lord. And that, that peace will turn to verse 16, that the word of, of Christ will dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that's what we're gonna do, uh, you know, as we take communion, is that together in, in spiritual songs and singing to the Lord and giving thanks to him, you know, it's gonna be such a, it's such a beautiful picture that we have as the church in unison and seeing that we're all together and we're saying, man, I've been changed. I've been changed. This is who I used to be, but God has changed me and I want to sing about it and I want to rejoice and I want to lift my hands and thank the Lord for what he's done in my life because it, it was out of my control. I couldn't have done it. But maybe you're, you're someone here today where you're saying, man, you know, I'm still struggling. I'm still it's so hard for me to put off my old man. It's so hard for me to practically, you know, give up my old self and, and how I used to live. You know, it's, it's encouraging and, and I love it. And, and I think that for this right now, um, you can give it to the Lord and say, Lord, would you take it? Would you take it? And so that's what we're going to do. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to have communion passed out. And, and this morning, you can take communion on your own. Um, I'll come back at the end, but you can just take it on your own. But I'm going to be up here in the front, and I'm going to sit right here in this seat. And if anyone needs prayer um, this morning, I want to I pray for you. Again, we haven't arrived. You know, we're still a work in progress. God is molding us as he's the potter and we're the clay. He's molding us. He's shaping us. And, um, but for some of you, you're, you're saying, man, I have not put off the old self. I, I'm still practicing sin. I'm still living in sin. Maybe it's some of the, on the list that we talked about, anger, Maybe it's sexual sin that you need to give over to the Lord and say, man, it's, oh, it's, it's overwhelming me. It's overwhelming me. This sin is overwhelming me and I just can't, I just need, I need prayer and, and I'll be up here. But I will say before we start worshiping, is there anyone that, that wants to give their life to the Lord today? Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you've never said, man, I, I want to open up that package and I want, to, I want to receive the life that only Christ can give. No one else can give it. No other God, no other goddess, no, you know, whatever. Only Christ can give you life. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, that's, I want that. 
Christ is giving you grace and you're saying, I want that. And, and uh, I just want you to be bold and raise your hand this morning and let's just all bow our heads and close our eyes. And if, if that's you and you want Jesus today, go ahead and just lift up your hand and I'll, I'll pray for you. Anyone at all? Awesome. And then as we worship, uh, if anyone needs prayer, uh, I'll be right here in the, the front and you can come pray and, and I'll be here afterwards too. But go ahead and take communion on your own and, and uh, maybe we could stand up too and, and sing to the Lord when you're ready.